Welcome to day number two of uh, I Annotate. Um, um, we had a great uh, time yesterday and uh, looking forward to get it, uh, getting, it, getting it going again today. Um, and I'm super uh, happy um, uh, to be introducing um, a panel that we've been talking about for a while now uh, and really honored to have um, a pretty extraordinary group of people who um, are some of the most um, thoughtful and thought-provoking people um, that I know um, in, in this field uh, who are working on um, pretty extraordinary projects. So let me first just kind of introduce the panel. Um, uh, Brewster Kale, a digital librarian from the Internet Archive. Uh, Jennifer Lin, who's a director of product management at Crossref. Uh, Dario Tarabarelli, the head of research at uh, the Wikimedia Foundation, and Elizabeth Cayley, the chief of staff at CZI, Chan Zuckerberg, Meta. Um, so um, over the last 25 years, the way that the world's knowledge infrastructure has transformed has been pretty revolutionary. I think we all know that. And the organizations up here are part of that story. We have a crowdsourced encyclopedia that's orders of magnitude more comprehensive, accurate, and timely than anything else that we've had in history. A free and open archive of most, most of everything that's ever been on the web. Free copies of a tremendous amount of the world's books, music, and software programs. And now, a growing searchable near real-time archive of dozens of the world's most important TV news channels going back a decade, and maybe more than a dozen, or dozens, I'm not quite sure. I haven't got the update. Um, we have a new resource that, using AI, reads the world's scientific papers and delivers their insights to scientists in real time so that they can make faster progress. It can predict with surprising accuracy the likely importance of an article within seconds of its publication and is now available to everyone for free forever. And we have a nonprofit service on the behalf of publishers that is opening the metadata about all scholarly works and creating permanent stable identifiers to them. But what lies ahead may prove to be even more breathtaking. We read science fiction because it frees us from the world that we know and allows us to imagine the world that might be. It can be a useful way to think about problems from a different perspective. The recent movie Passengers, with Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt, puts us in an enormous spaceship of 5,000 people traveling for 100 years to a new world to settle there. They carry with them all the supplies that they'll need to survive, all the accumulated knowledge of their species, a robotic doctor that can cure any disease, fix any injury. We naturally presume, if we think about it, that all that software on that spaceship is probably open source, the APIs extensively documented. <laughs> and of course, the information there is all free and open because anybody who cared about royalty payments would be dead long before any money would be able to be shipped back to them, either physically or digitally, um, from a ship traveling for over 100 years. Purely hypothetical? Not at all, because Elon wants to start manned missions to Mars within the decade. Apparently, for now, these will be one-way trips and everything folks will need to have to build to do what they're going to do um, will have to travel with them. And of course, this peculiar looking balloon, <laughs> which <laughs> um, hopefully we can get back on the screen, is um, the pressure vessel for the, um, for the fuel that will power that flight. So they just tested this out in the middle of the ocean um, about two or three weeks ago. Um, successfully, apparently. So um, while it sounds kind of fanciful, um, Elon, as we know, is, um, tends to accomplish the things he sets out to do, and he's now actively working um, to, to put this mission together. So the question um, that we have here is, what do we need to do to, in order to build the infrastructure we want for tomorrow? And of course, that begs the question, what do we want and why? So what I want to do is really get out of the way uh, and let um, the folks here talk a little bit about um, their vision for the future 
and how we can all work a little bit more effectively together to make that happen. So um, what we'll do is let each one of them share some of their thoughts um, and uh, uh, perhaps pose a few questions for each other, but fairly rapidly, I'd love to get to the point where we um, here open up uh, this to all of you. So um, I want to start with a few of my questions. So the first is, um, is what do we want? What are we trying to build? Uh, and what kind of knowledge uh, infrastructure um, do we need in order to get there? So let me kind of, let me start just um, right to left here and, and Brewster, why don't you go for it? Thank you. Uh, this is fantastic. I love the Bay Area because it's full of dreamers and builders. Uh, and I woke up in a fury this morning, so I thought I'd share that with you. Um, imagine if you're a graduate student in some field, you know, economics, medicine, history, law, biology, design, and you had an idea to do something new. But to understand it, to try something out, first you had to buy all of the books of the field. Uh, then you had to build a building to store all of these, these books. And then you had to hire a bunch of experts to help you sort through it. Sound ridiculous? Yeah, it is ridiculous. What you do when we were growing up is you went to a library in a university, and it was all, all there. But how about in the digital world? What if you wanted to build a better web search engine? What if you had a medical idea but needed to survey all of the papers? What if you had an idea of how the brain reacts to music and wanted to simulate the brain listening to all music? Can you do that in a university library? No, only at Google. They are the only ones with the library. Daniel Ellis, the best computer science music researcher in the world, tenured Columbia, law prof uh, Columbia uh, professor, left Columbia to join Google because he didn't have access to the data he needed. This is crazy. I came of age at the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT, where we were data starved. If we were going to develop real AIs, we needed the library of everything in digital form. And we needed reference librarians to be digital as well. I wanted that library to be in the public sphere so that everyone could dream and build. So I set out my career 35 years ago to build that library. Google is ahead of us and privatized it. But they have shown that it is possible and fantastic. The Internet Archive can be a piece of the solution to this. We now have the books, the scientific literature, the music, the television, the history of the web. It has taken decades and hundreds of millions of dollars. Now we need the middleware layers to make it so that there can be a graduate student that can build a new Google as a semester project a medical student that can do virtual studies on millions of people in a month, a history student that can model what would have happened if women and minorities' votes were not actively suppressed, would we be where we are now? We can do this. We're close. We need your help. Thank you. Brewster turned to me this morning, well, right before the panel started, and he said, let's go through some bombs. We're feeling it today, and this is the place to do it. So um, I, um, I think we will definitely start the day strong with a few <laughs> ball talk cocktails. <laughs> bad, bad, bad metaphor. Um, but um, thinking about what do we want in this future, which um, Dan has painted for us, is a really challenging thing for me because there's the nitty-gritty that um, all of us are involved in building, and it's a small piece of that much larger picture. Um, 
thank you. And but the the larger concepts and the larger design specifications that the entire ecosystem, if you will, needs is a whole nother um, level up or multiple layers up. Um, myself and a few collaborators have been thinking, trying to think about how do we see this entire problem as an ecosystem problem? The one major shortcoming to us putting our th heads together is that we didn't actually get any biologists or ecologists in this exercise. But anyway, so the, um, the, the, if we treat this ecosystem as a living entity that um, is robust and healthy environment, um, it would be productive, it would be resilient. Currently in the academic research um, industry, it is not at all the case. We have parties that have been working for quite a long time, many entrenched values and ways of, of, of working, um, whether it's in publishing, whether it's in, at the bench as a researcher, whether it's funding. Um, those, um, those have been going on for a long time, and they have put us in a place where we are quite fragile. We have many parties that are wondering, how do we deal with this new thing called the internet? I mean, that is not a resilient ecosystem. So one, one of the big pieces of, um, or uh, themes that have, has cropped up in thinking about this is diversity. And um, what that actually means, I think it would be, we, we need everyone to kind of weigh in. What does diversity mean in a vibrant ecosystem? We know that is a property. Um, what does it look like for the space that we all work in? And um, I, we have a paper out. Um, that might help start the conversation. I'll just re reference that. You can find it somewhere online. But um, I, I think that diversity is one of those things, um, and it will be great to hear more about um, what do we, how might we build toward this if we do agree that it, it is an attribute of this new world. Um, one of the things to build on top of that, uh, uh, on top of this diversity topic, is uh, ways in which these individual parties relate to one another, trust one another within this ecosystem. And, um, you know, on a very basic level, how do we even talk to each other? Um, this is a very interesting question because we not only have humans, but we have machines, which is something that I know Dan wants us to get into over the course of the hour. How do machines and humans, humans and humans, machines and machines talk to one another in this um, new world? That is something I'd like for us to consider. Um, but even when humans talk to humans, um, it, it doesn't translate well across disciplines. Um, uh, in another paper, a bunch of us have been thinking about preprints, and the term preprints means a million different things, and it's kind of that term that we want it to mean what we most need it to. And what we means is the specific local community needs, domain specific needs that are at hand. Given that there are many, multiple local domains. Um, this word preprints means a, a number of things. So the um, terminology is, has been and proves to be a very challenging thing. It has um, been not just obfuscating, but has created a lot of um, problems in, in trying to solve what we do have as shared problems um, on the table. I think that having a, um, a, some understanding as to what specific definitions are across communities will go a far um, ways, even if we cannot come to, say, a universal definition, which I would argue um, from linguistics is impossible anyway. Um, but at least it will help us get to a better understanding of what counts and how to validate it. I think those are kind of side issues that come out of um, this, this problem of language and terminology. Um, but that, I think, is another big topic that I think in our new world we will be much better equipped to, to solve. Um, I think, you know, I'll just close my intro remarks with one thing about the future. We, would, we need open scholarly infrastructure. And um, there's a, a piece out there that I wrote with others that begins to lay out some principles that we think um, are really important to 
creating, sustaining open infrastructure. And these principles fall along three axes. One is that it's community governed. Um, another that it is that these infrastructures are sustainable over time. They're um, financially, um, uh, et cetera. Also that it's forkable and it provides the community with insurance that even if infrastructure is no longer needed or something happens to it, it goes away the overall ecosystem can still find ways in which um, they can go about doing their work. So um, I, th I think uh, infrastructure, we'll hear a lot more about that later on. All right, so um, what do we want? I've been thinking a lot about that question. Um, and I was thinking that if you were to ask, uh, you know, um, a random sample of uh, cool kids from the Bay Area about the future of knowledge infrastructure, probably the answer you will get is something along the lines of, uh, I want systems that allow me to ask any question in like, using natural language and voice interfaces and get back like a seamless response as soon as possible with no barrier whatsoever, frictionless uh, uh, lookup of information. Um, I think it's a pretty good representation of uh, many things that are happening at the moment um, in the sort of knowledge ecosystem. Um, and personally, I want something very different. Um, so I'm trying to figure out why that is the case uh, and asking questions about uh, what, how like, the, the work I'm doing and the organization I'm working for uh, position itself with respect to that vision. And if anything, I. Personally, I don't want seamless and fast systems. I want to I wanna think of uh, slow systems that break down knowledge and they in fact do quite the opposite of what, say, answer engines are doing today. I don't want to have a quick lookup for something other than maybe how to translate feet into meters. That's something for which I'd like to have a, a lookup system. Um, but when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to knowing where information comes from, what are the processes that are behind uh, the making of something that we entertain as true. Um, I want to have the ability of inspect and reconstruct the, uh, the genealogy of knowledge. I want to see where it comes from. I want to see what are the quality insurance checks that have been put in place behind this knowledge. Um, and so to that aim, I think really what I'd like to see in terms of infrastructure is a uh, systems that uh, can support that vision. And I think the first, uh, the first piece of that is the idea that we need to build systems that allow us um, to share a common vocabulary. Um, I like to get to a point where every bit of knowledge that we, we entertain, what is a written knowledge or knowledge can be extracted from a database, uh, can reference uh, uh, an entity in a shared vocabulary. And I want the entity in itself to be something that is not owned by any single property or corporation. I like the, the entity itself to be something that's constructed collaboratively by the community. Um, the second piece I'd like to see in this like, slow system is uh, preservation of provenance. Um, I, I think one of the problems we see at the moment where, again, this like seamless um, computational uh, answer engines is that they have the tendency of uh, optimize for uh, quick lookups and quick responses at the cost of stripping provenance and not providing um, the consumer of this information any way of reconstructing where the information comes from. And I think what happened, I want to say just, over the past months in this country, but more generally, what's happening over the past years uh, all over the planet with people questioning something is entertained as a scientific truth uh, really calls for systems that do quite the opposite, that don't give quick answers, but allow us to reconstruct the provenance of information. Um, and uh, I think that the last piece of this is that I like to see knowledge systems that allow um, experts and, and lay people to uh, come together and share not just the vocabulary but also understanding of these concepts. Um, it, it struck me that 
you know, in, in the context of uh, the March for Science and initiatives that many of us, many in my world, uh, contributed to, uh, everybody was uh, it's like uh, infuriated about uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the public discourse is moving away from, uh, from scientific evidence. At the same time, we live in a world where science lives in this bubble and the vast majority of the output of science is not accessible by the regular person, by a patient, by a student, uh, unless they have a, um, a subscription to uh, some kind of uh, um, service that only universities can, and rich universities can pay for. Uh, that to me is the, uh, the fundamental problem, not having a shared space that is uh, in the open where citizens and experts uh, can, can share uh, in, in the definition and understanding of these objects. That to me is one of the biggest uh, problems we need to address with the design of the systems. Uh, so when Dan asked us uh, to take part in today, we were extremely excited and when he asked us then to think big, uh, we were even more excited uh, because that's what we like to do a lot on the meta team at Chan Zuckerberg. Um, we're in a, in a pretty unique position to be able to think about um, what we can do now for the next um, 80 or 100 years in order to uh, improve equality and, and equal um, opportunity for, for people all over the world. Um, and specifically on this subject, which is one that, again, the meta team has been thinking about a lot. Um, I invite you to, to imagine a world where we can tap into the brain of every single scientist who has ever lived, um, and that we can have access to um, humanity's collective understanding of all the mechanisms of life, all the mechanisms of nature and the universe, um, really everything that has advanced our human progress to date. Um, this would change the way that we ask questions going forward about scientific knowledge, um, how we tackle the next most important problems in front of us overall. Uh, and we all know here in this room uh, very acutely that uh, science drives all of modern life from what we're wearing to what we eat to the devices we put our crib notes on here at the front of the room. Um, but over the last 350 years, very little has changed about how we experience scientific knowledge. And it really exists in only two forms to this day. One which is uh, inside the brains of the living scientists on the planet. And the second is in the millions of articles and journals and textbooks and now web pages um, uh, digitally um, that have been written throughout history. But neither of those forms are really um, make it easy for us to understand the big picture, put it all together and understand how that sort of global uh, vision of knowledge actually exists. Um, and then to build on it very easily and very quickly uh, from a big picture point of view. So imagine if we created a third place that we could contain all of human knowledge. Um, for it to live, a place where the entirety of scientific understanding can be grasped and explored and examined at various levels, uh, at various levels of detail, whether you're a lay person or whether you're an expert, um, with a shared vocabulary. Um, so if you're coming new to a field or new to a particular area, you could actually really start to understand not only through reading thousands of articles or web pages, um, but by exploring dynamic, up-to-the-date models, really start to understand of where we are in the progress of understanding um, uh, nature's systems. And then imagine if this system was automatically updated um, to the minute when new discoveries and innovations were found. Uh, and um, imagine then if the system could generate new hypotheses that uh, automatically, by looking at the patterns in the data um, and looking to um, project where there might be potential connections between entities and nodes that human scientists haven't, uh, haven't thought of yet. And then we can go, as scientists, into the field, into the labs, um, and start to perform experiments based on these uh, hypotheses that would be generated by, by a system. Essentially, what we could do is start, have a new starting point, a new starting line for scientific knowledge. Um, and that's something that we think about a lot. How do we make all scientific knowledge computable? Thank you very much. So um, everybody up here is, 
uh, been handpicked, um, particularly because um, you guys have solved um, and continue to work on some really hard problems. And in particular, you know, Brewster, you having um, mined the web and um, scanned a lot of books um, and, and basically fought hard for access, not because you negotiated it, because, but because you, you extracted it. Um, Elizabeth at Meta, you guys, um, I, I, one of the most extraordinary things I think you did is negotiated um, access um, in a way that um, nobody had ever done before. Even Google Scholar hadn't negotiated um, the kind of full text um, access that, that you guys were able to pull off at Meta. Um, and Dario and Jennifer, you guys have been working together on a really interesting project, um, the Initiative for uh, Open Citations. Um, and Dario uh, showing a lot of leadership there, and Jennifer working from Crossref, who had the information um, to make available, um, but needed the impetus from outside to help um, uh, catalyze the publishers to, um, um, to go ahead and release that. And that those open citations can help us make public um, the links between data that can help us um, propel um, us forward. So the question I guess I have now is what exactly are the hard problems um, that we need to work on next? Um, and uh, I'm going to go in the reverse order. So. Sure. And great different points of view, but uh, there are lots, lots of problems. Some of them are technical, but I think the most important problems are not necessarily technical or certainly can't be solved by technology alone. Um, uh, and I, I feel um, in, extremely lucky to be building on the shoulders of giants because I do think the first problem is collecting the information. <laughs> uh, and so our, we use Crossref, we use um, the, the information from the publishers that you mentioned, um, and uh, you know, are in, in total awe of things like the Internet Archive where um, the first thing we have to do is get all this information together online in a format um, in our, in our, in our uh, view of the world in a, in a format that's computable, so, uh, so we, can, we can do more work on it. Um, then we have to capture and understand all the entities, um, and that's not an easy problem to do in all languages, um, in all fields, and make sure that we understand what, what, a, what an entity is and how they're related to each other. Um, and really, that great progress has been made there, um, but there's lots more work to do. Um, I think one of the hardest problems, and one that we're particularly focused on, is then how do you understand um, and extract the relationship between those entities. So in science, what's the relationship between this gene and this molecule, um, or this drug target and this disease? Um, and um, how, do you, how do you take that um, from the scientific literature, which is primarily what we focus on, um, and do it in a way that's important, and the hardest part is in context. So um, how, do you, how do you represent the paper, the lineage that you were speaking about a little bit earlier, um, where there is a relationship, but um, say this molecule has shown to um, help suppress tumors in, in mice populations, um, but then there's another a finding in another paper that says you know, that, doesn't, that, that same relationship doesn't seem to exist in human populations. So it's not just about finding where there are relationships, it's understanding the type of relationships, the directionality of relationships, if that's possible, the strength, and most importantly, the context. Um, there's a couple other I'm going to skip. There's um, lots of interesting problems around visualization and annotation and having a way that um, uh, both, both the expert populations and the lay populations can, can comment and ask questions and help evolve the model uh, or the models as, as they progress. Um, it has to happen at scale. <laughs> In the time that we're up here um, on this panel, there's another 200 uh, new scientific papers published in biomedicine alone, and that rate is uh, doubling every nine years. So we need something that's, that's going to keep up with, with all of our, our innovations and discoveries. Um, but I think the most important problem uh, is bias. Uh, is um, taking all of the information um, that has gone back 350 years. Uh, I don't think anybody would think that the uh, 22, 23 million um, uh, published scientists would, um, uh, uh, in throughout all history, would actually represent, uh, uh, be a good representative population um, for, for the rest of the planet. Um, so anything that we build that's based on existing knowledge uh, and that comes from human is going to come with all of those biases. So how do, we, how do we accommodate for that? How do we make that entirely transparent? And over time, um, how can we change that? Uh, 
All right. So yeah, I actually second that a lot. I don't think that the uh, the hardest problems are necessarily technical problems. Um, I think there are there are questions around sustainability. A few people brought this up. Then you, you brought this up too. Um, I guess the question of uh, uh, how to build systems that are open and, and reusable and support an ecosystem as opposed to supporting one individual player and maybe resulting a few days, a few years uh, uh, down the line in something that just disappears because of there's no more funding or there are different business priorities. Um, that is a hard question. And it's a hard question that I think um, this group of people and the organizations that you represent uh, uh, can contribute to to answer. I think that all the technical problems around uh, information extraction, entity matching, uh, harvesting of facts and literature, they're all tractable. There are uh, scalability issues, there are technical problems, but it, in terms of like, uh, you know, finding the best ways of uh, uh, disambiguating entities and whatnot, but these are all like technical, technically tractable problems. Uh, what is, in my opinion, not easily tractable at the moment is how to figure out uh, um, the design for a, a graceful integration of the systems that is um, uh, conducive to uh, the creation of a, a commons-based um, infrastructure. Um, and on that note, I want to I wanna say something more specific. I think the uh, uh, one of the themes that have, have emerged recently is this big debate between so like a centralized versus distributed and federated uh, um, approaches to building this ecosystem. And personally, I found that question fascinating and also extremely complex. Um, it's, a, it's a mix, uh, again, it's not so much a, a technical problem, it's more a question about governance and um, social, like social aspects of, uh, of technology. And um, I, I feel, uh, that's actually one question I'd like to ask the, the panel later on. Um, I'd like to see how we uh, individually stand with respect to that question of centralization versus uh, federation or, or um, decentralization. Um, because I believe that that's something that may um, that may work differently along different dimensions. There, uh, I'm curious about your thoughts around uh, you know centralization around uh, identity or, or branding versus decentralized infrastructure. Um, I, I like to maybe help unpack this question, which to me is one of the uh, hardest problems that um, the uh, the knowledge infrastructure um, ecosystem is facing at the moment. I agree with Dario, and that is actually um, one of the hard problems that I think is probably in, um, there is no clear-cut answer, and the, ans the most appropriate answer that is best for the entire ecosystem, were there to be one, would change over time anyway. But So I, I think this is a good, ongoing, perpetual, eternal question. Um, and two others, um, the question of public versus private, it's not necessarily, I, I support openness. Um, I don't think there are very few people who do would say open all the way down, only open. Um, th there is a proper space for open. For some of it, it's much larger than for others. But that line between public and private, I've, you know, I think most people, insofar as both exist, they exist within the larger ecosystem. And, and so how can we design this system um, in order to support whatever advantages can accrue out of both. Um, so th that's one of the hard problems. Um, another hard problem, I think, that we need to tackle is how do we support both cooperation and competition? Um, I think this is, it comes down to human nature, what drives us, what are our incentives. Um, the human nature part is human nature. Um, that may well not be changeable, but um, the external conditions within which all of us work under, within which we work, um, is, is, is definitely part of the question, right? And can we design a system where cooperation flourishes, where competition 
may occur um, in, in, in a productive manner, right? And I think a lot of that may very well touch upon, um, have, have a lot of touch points with the public versus private question. One of the offshoots of the centralization versus decentralization or federation question, which Dario raised, um, is a small minor, I guess, use case, if you will. will. I think the bigger, the bigger use case is um, at the level of systems, right, and ecosystem. But I was listening to a, an interview with, with Cal Newport recently. I don't know how many of you have heard of him, but he got me thinking about a different way or a minor use case of this whole centralization versus decentralization problem, um, which is at the level of the individual. So there is the individual, say a researcher or a, um, a lay person, and there is thinking that um, goes on in the process of knowledge production, right? But with all of our internet technologies, all of which us on the stage are part of building, um, we have, um, we've constructed what he calls, you know, the hyperactive hive mind available to us. So this tension between deep work, his term, versus hyperactive hive mind, I think is going to be one of the really big questions for all of us as we think about the tools that we use, the tools that we build, how do we create them in a way where we still have and hold on to the conditions in which knowledge production needs to happen. Perhaps it's a particular form um, that deep work, he calls, um, is situated within. Um, but I think, you know, we all, I'm sure, have struggled with uh, balancing, you know, the notifications and the new, new tweets that have popped up and the onslaught of research articles that we feel we need to stay abreast of. Um, that, is a, that is the hyperactive hive mind. And so what type of social processes do we need to have in place in order to better find that balance between the, um, the um, individual work versus the decentralized, tapping into the decentralized aspects of it is another big problem. Post-truth, alt-facts. Do you take this personally? I think you should. We're fucking up at a scale that is damaging things. The, the, the movie of Open does not have its ending written yet. It's up to us. It's going to be written by us. We have to show the value of Open, and we actually have to prove that it actually works better uh, for people. We can fix this. And it's really, I see a bunch of it is our fault. And we have to fix it. We have to show the value of open. We have to go and sort of tie it all back around. We have access to a lot of this information. We have networks. We have communication structures to people. We conned everyone into turning to their screens to answer questions. And what have we built? What have we gotten? We've got a problem out there, and it's a lot of it is our fault. So we need to pivot around, examine ourselves, look at what we've done, and fix it. Um, we have good data. We've got people earnestly trying to figure out answers to questions, and they're coming up with what? So how can we make systems that can help people answer problems and questions that are more deep than what you can with the current web services. That is our challenge, our opportunity. We've got everybody by their screens. Let's go and build a better system. We need middleware layers that allow a lot of different systems to bloom. We need to tame petabytes. As Danny Hillis put it 30 years ago, we need the spreadsheet of big data. How do you go and make it so that it's manageable, um, such that you can go and leverage what it is that we have at our capability and actually make it useful to people? I'm motivated. I'm looking for others that want to help with it, too. OK, um, we are going to, we have a, our human mic stand, otherwise known as Artie, um, over there. and. Um, if you guys have questions for the panel, um, stand up and let them fly. 
Hello all, good morning. Um, I, I, it seems like you're all bumping up against the same thing, which uh, I want to provide a reflection for how I know it, which is where, so we're dealing with knowledge systems, information, structuring it, and then what's, for me, what's missing is, like, when it comes to applying this, there's still myself and how I'm being when I'm applying this. And that, for people, is a tricky part because it doesn't work in the same way as structuring something outside of myself. And so interfacing people where knowledge doesn't make a difference, it occurs to me that communication isn't about knowing things. It's about discovering other people's peopleness. And that, that's where I'm seeing that you, the, like the traction to really have all this latent knowledge, you know, the power of knowledge, actually enter the world through people's interaction. Like, that's, that's what I hear you're bumping up against. Is, what, any comments? Give us a question. Uh, do, does that, are we talking about the same thing? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so as someone who, who comes from, you know, the the open community and is now deep within the bowels of a large publishing company. Um, this is something that I struggle with on a daily basis. Um, and uh, I think you, you're right, Brewster, exactly when you say that um, this crisis that we've been given um, is, uh, is a huge problem but I also believe we shouldn't waste a really good crisis. And we have, this, we have this great opportunity to take the value um, that is in foremost in everyone's minds of expert curation of things, right? And the value of experts and really use that to make the case for, um, for what it is that we do as a community and how openness, you know, um, allows people who are engaged in the process of their daily life um, can um, engage with, with um, and see the value of experts. All the studies, you know, in the survey still show that the population trusts scientists more than they do politicians. So, you know, I just wanted to, I have no question, I just wanted to put it out there <laughs> that I think, that I think, you know, first of all, I'm rising to your challenge, and we should not waste a good crisis. Thanks, William. Okay, I'm gonna mandate a question. Okay. Short and good. to the point. To somebody, I have a question. To somebody on the panel. I have a question, and it's to all of you on the panel, but you primarily, um, <clears throat> Dan, because I think you know the most about hypothesis. So, when Dan, I was moved, <clears throat> when Dan gave his talk at the Personal Democracy Forum, he made a convincing case that we're facing an existential crisis as humans. Am I wrong? That's what you were saying. We don't, we're halfway through a very thin carbon layer. If we don't do it, there is, our planet doesn't have the resources for intelligent life to evolve again. Okay, now the next thing that I asked is, if what you're trying to do is put a conversation layer over all knowledge, that conversation layer is going to, if all knowledge exists on the internet, that conversation layer is going to be bigger than the internet. But the mathematician in me says, what if all knowledge was a variable called x, and there was only one website in the world that contained one character, the letter x? Of course, the computer scientist in me wants that character to be a dot. And your task is, as humans, Create a conversation layer over that X or that dot that consists all no contains all knowledge. So that, and you also made the case that <clears throat> the person who controls the real estate controls the narrative. And you were you were saying, okay, we'll give two thirds to the guy who built the real estate, but we want one third for the rest of us. But I think that the letter X takes up a lot less. So my question. Are you up to that? Because I own www.org, and I want to put a dot there, and I want to challenge you, is your tool up to implementing that conversation layer all, over all the knowledge where that dot or the X is the unknown? 
and we can get rid of all that real estate. With a little help from my friends, yes. <laughs> okay, so I propose we, we, we take that as a parallel approach. Mike, I want a question. Okay, this is a question, honestly. Um, two sentences of prep for the question. In the 1960s, you know, we had a series called Star Trek, and they showed a computer based on their understanding of what computers were at that time. Then we had amazing people. We had Engelbart, we had Adele Goldberg, we had Alan Kay, we had Ward Cunningham, we had people who realized that it was really about computers helping people to think better, right? Showing people how to think. And so my area is, is really, uh, you know, I come from education, and that's what I'm interested in, is technology that doesn't give us answers like a Star Trek computer, but technology that trains us and puts us into the grooves of productive thought, of, of thought that benefits society. So my question is, since I, I completely agree, Silicon Valley is obsessed with the Star Trek computer. It's a billion dollar enterprise down here. Can we get to where we need to get unless we kill this ridiculous dream, okay, of everybody being Captain Kirk? That's my question. So I think that one of Darius' comments earlier um, speaks to your question, which is provenance and um, can we get what Elizabeth has called the lineage of the production of knowledge. You know, the, journalism is trying to tackle this right now with the rise of alt facts and et cetera by showing, and they've been doing this even before, right, this um, term has become the death knell of democracy in the US um, with, you know, by, exposés that highlight, say, um, the funding that went into this particular effort, this campaign, et cetera, right? Those are all ex um, unveiling what has happened so that everyone knows. And I think the, the, the question of provenance, the question of lineage, um, of, of, of knowledge, that's, those are all um, analogical. And the more that we can build that into the system so there aren't machines that give you, say, the easy answer, um, the better off we'll be. Yeah, I'm gonna read off that, if I may. Um, there's this beautiful quote that says that the, uh, the, the non-profit product um, is a changed human being. And I, I look at that quote when someone brought it up to me and I was thinking, even in the context of Wikipedia, which in a way sounds like the easy answer to that question, are we living up to that standard? And I don't think we are. Um, so back to your point, um, there's a question of storing and structuring collecting knowledge. There's a question of changing human beings and giving them the tools to understand and to form a, informed opinions about uh, anything. And if you go and read any, any Wikipedia article on something slightly scientific, good luck you know, learning about some notion of statistics uh, or, or um, genomic or you, you name it. Um, I think we still have a massive challenge in bridging, like I said before, the question of uh, you know, storing and representing knowledge for experts on the one hand and turning the system to something that can change uh, the public understanding of this knowledge. Um, and I, I think you're totally right. That is the number one question to me when you try and answer today. Uh, so this is a question to Meta. When I hear computable knowledge, I think Wolfram Alpha. I know a bit about the pipeline that that company uses to curate knowledge and make it computable. And I wonder uh, whether or not you've learned from that and how you might be advancing the story. It's a great question. There's, there certainly is, um, again, building on the shoulders of giants there. Um, it's something that um, our co-founder, Sam Mullen, who couldn't be here today, um, uh, uh, we talk about a lot. Um, so uh, happy to take the conversation offline. I'm not the, the expert in, in, in the room or in the organization, but um, it really is um, where a lot of the inspiration comes from. Hi, question for Dario. Um, I really appreciated preservation of provenance. I hadn't heard that term before, and it's uh, really opening. I had a question about the community curated common vocabulary you mentioned. I'm curious what projects you see now and how you see going into the future. How will we agree on how to reference uh, either entities in the world or ideas? 
how can we even approach such a problem? Excellent. Yes. Um, yeah, so shameless plug, time, yes. Okay. Um, one, one project that I, I'm very excited about um, going that direction is uh, Wikidata. Wikidata is uh, the most recent addition to Wikimedia's projects. Um, it's uh, uh, an open knowledge base that works at Wikipedia. It's transparent, it's uh, editable by anyone, uh, it's curated by humans and machines alike, uh, it provides powerful APIs, um, and it, it tries and, and, and create what I see as the glue of uh, the vocabulary that can be, um, that can connect uh, knowledge bases uh, across disparate fields. So I'm really excited about that, and I'm, and I'm seeing like a, like many organizations trying to figure out how to cooperate with, with that to create like the backbone of knowledge um, using data that is entirely in the, in, in the public domain with no copyright restrictions. Um, so um, I think that that's something great that's happening uh, in that direction. Um, the, one, the one challenge they see speaking to people who have been doing this for, for years, there are great communities of bio curators uh, who have been using, you know, soft money from uh, governmental agencies to build open knowledge bases that are taxpayer funded and that can then be reused uh, by the public. And the number one challenge that these people report when I ask them, okay, what was the problem that keeps you um, up at night, uh, is the fact that these knowledge, knowledge bases are, are siloed and they typically can disappear or become unusable after soft money disappears, right? So I think the question go, goes back to the sustainability issue. How, how can we build an ecosystem where all these efforts that very often are funded by a taxpayer can result into uh, a, a knowledge base or a, share, or a network of knowledge bases that is sustainable and it doesn't disappear after three or five years? Um. I want to come back to um, a subject that came up a couple times, which is distributed versus federated systems, uh, or centralized systems, rather. Um, and, um, you know, my question is, can you do what you do um, in that kind of worldview? And, Brewster, would there be an interplanetary file system involved in that? Systems are harder to build than centralized systems. I, I really like the line, I want a system that works as well as a centralized system and fails as well as a decentralized system. Um, and it's really, really hard. I asked Vince Cerf, who, who um, like, how did you go and make the internet protocols work in a decentralized way, such that if any particular piece of it gets nuked, it still works around. Um, and he said that it took a year of about seven people sitting together, and they had one guy that was, I don't remember his name, who was supposed to debug it. So they came up with an idea on how to solve problems, and then this one guy would go and say, no, if this happens, the whole thing falls apart. And they'd say, shit! And they'd have to go back, and they'd have to try to figure out how to make the protocols work again. And they just did this for a year to come up with TCP IP. Um, the World Wide Web is uh, awesome, but but it's really fragile. I mean, the cool thing about it is it took, it would take an afternoon in Perl, if you remember that programming language, an afternoon in Perl to make a web server. And that was a huge advantage at the time, but it's really shown its problems. We've got, we've got an infrastructure that's long in the tooth. Snowden has pointed out every pro, in a lot of problems of building a web the way that we did. You say it's decentralized because it's got lots of, but no, it's, you, know, you stand in the way of WikiLeaks, you can watch all the traffic to it, and the GCHQ did and handed it to the NSA. So it, it, we got a problem uh, out there. So, but it's easier to build centralized systems uh, than decentralized systems. We have to go the extra mile. So even if we've gone and built a centralized system, then we have to take it the next mile and make it decentralized. This is very difficult to do within the capitalist system, um, and it's really hard to do ego-wise, but it's important uh, to take the next step, whether it's Wikipedia or the Internet Archive, we've got to go and take it apart and make it a decentralized system. On that question, um, I guess I'll speak 
within from the perspective of um, scholarly communications, I think that there um, this is a bounded space. The those who benefit from it is unbounded, but there are specific parties that play certain roles within the space. And um, in this environment, I haven't seen much hope or possibility for decentralized infrastructure. Um, something as simple as persistent identifiers has been shown to work in a centralized environment. So, I mean, take it with a grain of salt, I work for a centralized party that serves an infrastructure, a scholarly infrastructure. Um, I, I, I think that, um, to Dario's point, there are many of these infrastructures that um, serve very important needs. The question of sustainability is a problem. I, I, decentralization may help with that, or that concept or model might address some of those is financial issues. But um, from a very practical standpoint, um, there are certain, um, I guess, fundamental things that all of us need in order to do the work, to build on that work, to share that work. And I, I, to me, it seems like that part of bottom layer of infrastructure needs to be centralized. Yeah, um, I, I agree in a, in, a, in a very much much like the, uh, the quote about uh, failing and succeeding um, in terms of centralization, decentralization. Um, I believe the, 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 my way of re rephrasing that question is to think about uh, the problem of, uh, the two separate problems of centralization and decentralization at the infrastructural level and at the social level. Um, and I want to call out the example of uh, hypothesis in the open annotation standards. Um, I think it's an extremely bold move. <laughs> what you know, hypothesis and organization and the movement involved uh, uh, have invested into of creating basically a self-effacing um, layer that really doesn't require specific application, specific vendor to be able to contribute um, th this kind of data just using interoperable systems uh, and, um, and infrastructure. Um, the, the main question that I have is how that works uh, uh, at the social layer. Um, something that we've seen a lot at Wikimedia is the fact that, ironically, the Wikimedia movement is extremely distributed and decentralized internally. So when people think about Wikipedia, think about the website, but the making of that content is the result of a, a large number of disparate communities and tools and uh, that really not much to do with, with each other. Um, but what keeps them aligned, in a way, what keeps their, uh, their purpose aligned to a shared vision is the centralization of, uh, of the brand. And it's kind of weird to speak of a brand for, for a nonprofit project, but that's really what it is about, like uh, knowing that um, a label um, like Wikipedia is associated with, you know, open licenses and no control by uh, governmental or private uh, um, properties. Um, it comes with the fact that uh, the data that is collected, the behavioral data, is not sold to anyone. Like these values are something that, to me, are a benefit of a centralized system, and they can work uh, really effectively at aligning uh, the purpose of people who believe. Uh, into this notion of building the commons. The question is how to combine that centralized aspect uh, with infrastructure that aims to be as self-effacing and, uh, and, and decentralized as possible. And I don't have the answer, but I'm, I'm looking at this space uh, with a lot of interest and curiosity. No. <laughs> no, uh, OK. <laughs> no. Um, so. A decentralized system. So I, I take some of the, 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 the really kind of great ones. Um, scientific literature itself. So the Enlightenment ideal had a basic set of rules of what it took to get a, a science, piece of scientific literature written, and it was a decentralized model. I'd say even Stallman's GNU thing uh, was a decentralized model. You just adapted to this, and it worked. And it was a license, and you can even rev with the license a little bit before you get Stallman crawling down your pants. Uh, but it, uh, but it, it, it worked as a system uh, towards, towards moving forward. Even libraries in the print era, I would say, were a decentralized system. And as the digital wave has gone over us, 
We've taken the easy way out and centralized things. And we've ended up with JSTOR, Hathi Trust. Um, we've ended up with Wikipedia, Internet Archive, Crossref. These are centrally owned and controlled entities that there's some part of it that it provides the brand, the centralization, the, the, uh, the, the, the local structures that are not only its greatness, but it's an undoing. And if we're going to build long-term robust structures um, that are gonna outlive the generation that built the, uh, the original ones, it's most likely to be a decentralized structure that allows adaption, revolution, and still coherence enough uh, to move forward, which we saw in the physical era. And there's this network effect of winner takes all in our, our area. And there's this ability to step forward and own and control a space. Isn't it completely weird that you can go and rent a taxi in Madrid and pay 25% of that fee to a company in Silicon Valley? Isn't that the weirdest thing? I mean, it's great, I use it all the time, but that ain't no de decentralized system. So I, it is hard to build things that are really, honest to God, decentralized. And I tip my hat to those that have figured out how to do it. I haven't yet, um, and we're struggling with it, and we'd like uh, ideas and, and help with it. So yes, there's lots of communities building Wikipedia, but there are some centralized problems with how some of those things work, and we're seeing it happen for real. So I'm not trying to beat up on you, but let's. This is the group that's going to think big, um, and and think about the structure of how things work. Let's do our jobs really right if we possibly can. It may take some steps along the way through through places that we don't necessarily want to be, but let's keep our eye on the big picture. Can I respond? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't disagree on the big picture. I want to take a realistic, uh, a pragmatic approach to how to get there. And it's funny you brought up uh, the scholarly system. I cannot think as of today, I mean, the, the scholarly system is the most ridiculous centralized system at the moment. And we're in the digital era. In the digital era. In the print era? Right. Was it? Right, right no, I, I, I get it. Yeah, I agree with you on that, on that point. Um, but changing, so changing the current system and the incentives and the reputation system that lies behind uh, the current state of, uh, of scholarship to go to a fully distributed system is going to require more than just coming up with, a, with a, uh, uh, an excellent distributed um, technological solution. It's going to require realigning the functioning of funding, the functioning of uh, how people decide what to work yes. on. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I'm looking at the preprint movement uh, as a great... Wait, we've, got, we've got Chan Zuckerberg on stage, right? Right, right, right. right? We, 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 we've, got, uh, we've got opportunities here to do something. Right, but so what I want to say is that I totally agree. It's a freaking hard problem, and the one thing I want to say about... Uh, Wikimedia is the most horribly centralized uh, uh, entity. I agree, I agree with you on that one. So internally, like I said, it's a collection of lose actors, but as a property, as a, as, a, as a website, it is extremely centralized, and in, in that respect is not tremendously resilient. Um, there are some benefits to it, and the one that I didn't mention before is um, uh, sustainability from a financial standpoint. Right now, uh, the vast majority of the revenue of the Wikimedia Foundation still comes from individual donations. And that is something, I, I think it's hard to generalize, because uh, Wikipedia just happens to be in that spot of the internet out of uh, some historical accident. Um, but it allows, uh, like that centralization allows uh, uh, something is in the common good to be maintained uh, primarily out of individual donations without any major players having control on that. I'd like to see like, what are like, practical steps that even on the financial and governance sustainability can be implemented uh, to build something that A, is open and not open by anyone, but also financially sustainable in an independent way. Dan, we've got some questions over here. Hi. Um, I heard expert a heck of a lot, and I want to just say amateur, because amateur and expert, they're, they're 
you know, Dario answered uh, one of my questions um, about uh, uh, you know the, the, these contributions, and people have been talking about integrating non-experts, but certainly amateur is a very positive way of saying non-expert. Um, Bernard Stiegler is a theoretician, um, a digital theoretician from France. He talks about a contributory, not a participatory, but the contributions that everyday people, steel workers, people who work in garages, um, make to the knowledge of the community. And the community knowledge is what the answer that I got from Dario, which is talking about Wikipedia. But the community knowledge does need to be distributed locally, known locally, and contributed locally. Um, what's what's your question? What's the question? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> Dario kind of answered it, but I just want um, to ask if we could use the word amateur as opposed to non-expert. Jack, Artie, I want you to enforce questions. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so we often talk about centralized and decentralized, but really what I think we care about is failure under a variety of uh, different case, cases and how we recover from that. And whether the system is centralized or decentralized doesn't matter, right? Um, so I wonder whether is there some way that we can think about this in terms of robustness rather than centralized and decentralized. We're gonna let Jennifer. Did you? Um, I, I'm not quite sure I fully grokked the question, but um, to add to the decentralized versus not uh, federated, sorry, centralized versus decentralized question, I, I guess I, uh, f personally, I don't necessarily, and I'm not accusing you of this, Brewster, of, sure, sure, of associating sure. um, a centralization with authoritarianism um, but some do and so I, I guess I would um, encourage us to think of more uh, of broader meanings um, rather than that more extreme end to Dario's point there are um, you know because something is centralized there may be it may be uh, the way that it is run, the, the governance, the um, um, engagement may yet be decentralized. So there are different levels, whether it's the technology, the operations, the, um, the content um, uh, production, ex um, the governance, um, the f finance, the brand. I mean, there are many, many different levels. So when we're talking about centralization versus federation, it may, um, we may also benefit from thinking more nuanced um, that there are, there are different layers and it's not one thing all the way down. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get your, your question though. Just to clarify, it's that decentralization or federation are ways of building systems that are designed to prevent a certain class of failure modes. And they don't protect against all classes of failure modes. Centralized systems are susceptible to a, you know, some similar and but many other types of failure modes, right? And the question is, should we have a conversation about what failure modes we find acceptable, um, such as being spied on by our governments, um, and are there others that we need to just sort of accept that they're gonna happen sometimes? So it's a question about, should we be having a conversation about robustness, which is more technical in a sense, um, rather than the one which is, well, do we want centralized or decentralized? Great point. One last question, and then we gotta go. Okay, great. I'm gonna take us in a slightly different direction, I guess. Um, so I was really struck by Elizabeth's point about the bias of existing knowledge kind of inflecting um, any, anything new that we build on top of it. Um, and my training is in library and information science, um, so that's very much in line with my understanding of how information's created in very particular, often implicit contexts. Um, so I'd just love to hear from the rest of you as well kind of about this issue uh, of bias and kind of what happens when you port information from one context to another. And in this case, we're talking, I think, about open, more open contexts. Um, yeah, so, uh, and kind of how we can address that. I can start with that one. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it is, a, I think, like a, a really high priority question for many people working in that space. I can speak for, for Wikimedia. Um, I wanna tell a story of something that not many people necessarily uh, know about. 
Um, so Wikipedia is still primarily created by Western young male contributors. Uh, they tell the story of you know, the world's knowledge from an extremely limited and privileged standpoint. Um, there are ridiculous gaps in this knowledge and, and skews. Um, one of my favorite examples is that uh, there are 20,000 articles on French Wikipedia about individual asteroids, but a language like Hausa that is spoken by 30 million people in Central Africa doesn't have an entry on the universe. Um, so if you take the, the, the sum of all knowledge that is representing Wikipedia, and you look at where it comes from and who created it, it's ridiculously skewed and slanted towards uh, the demographic of the contributors. The problem with that is not just with Wikipedia. Wikipedia, not many people may know, but the contents get translated into RDF uh, via project like DBpedia. They're then propagated to the rest of the internet. Uh, and basically, every single link data system that you use today, what is like a search engine for music or biomedical information, gets its entities, gets its like a fundamental relations uh, from Wikipedia. So bias in, bias out, uh, the fact that it's a small population of contributors that are creating data and information that powers the entire ecosystem that AI relies upon, I think is a fundamental problem that we all should be uh, worried about. I've been very encouraged by watching some of the studies of how people use the web. People are very particular and very peculiar. Nobody wakes up in the morning saying, hey, I want to live a biased life. Or, hey, I really want to go to the biased and unfair news channel. Um, what I think we're missing out there are tools for context and citation. We've made it hard for people to actually know what the hell they're looking at. Um, that we've made it so that it's really difficult to go and understand, is this some babble that just uh, uh, has been bouncing around for a long time and long discredited? Or is this um, something that actually is real and I have trusted sources behind it? So I'm encouraged by people want to have access to this stuff. The, the Internet Archive gets three, four or five million people a day coming and using uh, its services, as best we can tell. Uh, it's about the 300th most popular. This is about the, most, the fifth most popular. Um, okay, I'm a little envious. Um, but it does indicate that there's a lot of interest in finding deeper information than is casually uh, uh, available. So people want it. That's the good news. Now we need to build some of the tools, I would suggest, for citation, for context, and embed it. And that's what this whole conference is about. I'm really glad to be here. Sorry, one last note on context. I, I think you've gotten to the heart of a really, really big problem, which we missed out on. The entire problem of knowledge production is about context, not just merely switching from one platform to another, but you know, to take a, 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 perhaps a banal um, example, a, a researcher who read a paper of um, a, a lab that performed a set of experimental conditions, that requires a context change for if you are working on a different organism, if you, even if you're trying to validate and reproduce those results, that is a context change which requires translations. So big, new big problem, we should definitely work on this. I think with that, we will wrap it up. And just want to say thanks to the panelists and uh, for coming up here and sharing. <laughs>